Hello and welcome to Long Beach Lens. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson, Executive Director of the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Our guest today is the Program Director of Long Beach Residents Empowered, or LIBRE. Please join me in welcoming Jorge Rivera. Thank you, you thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So, um, LIBRE, it's a new organization, but prior to that, you were involved as uh, a community organizer in Long Beach, and what were some of the things that you accomplished in that role prior to coming into LIBRE? Uh, well, I have been organizing for about four years, mm -hmm. uh, approximately, and I was organizing for another housing advocacy organization. Right. Uh, and LIBRE sort of formed because the, the residents asked me to, to help them organize a new organization mm -hmm. that focused a little bit more on a bottoms-up approach and right. that organized residents and uh, tried to shift power right. back to the community. And also they wanted to have a little bit more focus on education training and uh, they wanted us uh, to be able to support the, the emotional and the psychological health of our residents because they're mm -hmm. undergoing a lot of stressful events, especially when it comes to evictions, moving, or just living in uninhabitable conditions. Mm -hmm. And so they felt that that was a real need that uh, the other organization that we were currently with wasn't, um, wasn't addressing. And so when we, when we broke off, we, uh, we sort of formed Libre, but it was more because the residents had asked me to stay on and, and help them organize it. Now, I met you um, just maybe a year ago or so when we were talking about uh, local hire policy in Long Beach, and you even then were bringing residents before city council, helping them to basically give their testimony as to the conditions that they were living in. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, as I listened to it, I, even though I work with low-income families, I was blown away by just the deplorable conditions right here in our city that people are living in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think people would be amazed if they heard some of those stories, right? Yes, <laughs> I think uh, not only amazed, but I think some would be appalled. Right. Uh, just to share one or two, uh, there was a sober living facility that was housing a, a few residents, about three to a room, uh, as they normally do in sober living facilities. And these folks were living without a functioning toilet for several weeks. So you can only imagine the, what they had to do to be right. able to just uh, live in, in that place right. and adjustments that they had to make. They were living with uh, their kitchen floor that was completely opened. All the floorboards were taken out and repairs were not being done in an expeditious fashion. So they had to literally walk a plank to cross, uh, to cross their, their kitchen floor. And these are the kind of the conditions and these are some of the, the situations that, that I've seen. I've literally sat with residents just the way you and I are sitting here mm -hmm. and as we're sitting down seeing mice run across the floor mm -hmm. and with roaches crawling on the walls and it's, it's actually astonishing that, that, that people are still living in these conditions and so that's what we do is we try to empower these mm -hmm. folks and educate these folks on what their rights are, mm -hmm. try to help them push and advocate for, for better protections and more habitable living conditions and so that sometimes means we have to take them to City Hall so that our city leaders that actually put these laws into place get to hear what's actually happening on the ground. And sometimes uh, people say, well, why don't they speak up? Why don't they do something about it? But I know once a, uh, one of our teens came to me when I first took this position talking about similar conditions, but their, her parents were afraid to say anything to the landlord for fear of being evicted. That's right. a very real uh, issue as well, correct? Yes, that's a very real issue, and it happens more often than not. Right. A, lot of, uh, a lot of people on the other side of this uh, debate, they say, well, the state law says that that type of behavior from a landlord is considered retaliatory and against the law. However, what's written on paper and what actually happens yeah. on the ground <laughs> and what happens in reality are two different things. Right. And so people will get constantly threatened, harassed, and, or they'll get their rents increased because we have no tenant protections against that. Right. So even though they might not get evicted, they might get their rents increased and get displaced in, in that fashion as well. Right. And then when they go to, to eviction court, the, the law doesn't always necessarily favor their side and, right. and it's always really difficult, and any lawyer will tell you this, difficult to prove retaliation in, in a court of law. Right. Now I know that you had some facts and statistics that sort of set the framework for where we are right now. Can you share a little bit of that insight? 
Absolutely, because I think context is important, yeah. you know, yeah. just so that people can really get an idea of what's right. actually happening. Right. So, uh, eighty percent of our very low income are experiencing one habitable, uh, one housing issue, such as cost burden, overcrowding, mm -hmm. or just uh, uh, substandard living conditions. Uh, Eighty-five percent of our rental housing is over thirty years old. Twenty-seven percent of renters are paying over fifty percent of their income towards rent. And that equates to about 73,600 families. Wow. That's a lot of folks. Wow. And uh, we have about over 4,000 4, people that are homeless. And when Section 8 opened up after 12 years of being closed, they opened up their application process and we experienced over 19,000 applications. So that just gives you an idea of wow. kind of the need that, that we have for more affordable housing and sort of the, mm -hmm. the conditions that people are living under. Now, 19,000 applications for how many slots? Do you remember? That oh, number? well, uh, the, the Section 8, uh, the, what's, what we're experiencing is because the, the vacancy rate in Long Beach is, is about 2%. Huh. So that means that you have people yeah. pretty much lining up to rent apartments. Right. And when landlords are able to get market rate prices for their units, right. they're less likely to open and them up Section to Section 8, 8 tenants. Right. And so people, even though you qualify for a Section 8 voucher, mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult to find an apartment mm -hmm. that will actually accept it. So we have mm -hmm. people actually losing their vouchers because they can't find an apartment mm -hmm. unit in time. Now, with all the development going on downtown, I would imagine that's having an adverse effect too on affordable housing. Sure. How would you describe that scenario? Sure. Well, I mean, there's studies that are done that that development, because some some people argue a uh, part of this debate that that we need just more development so that we sort of loosen up the the supply and demand that that's that's mm -hmm. taking place. But what we studies have shown that that in the short term, development actually increases rents. And if we're developing market rate housing or units that are really high in rent, that actually starts to affect the surrounding communities. And so we're seeing our rents rising. Even in a report uh, from apartmentlist.com showed that our rents increased 10.8% wow. in the last year. And so that brings our average for about a two bedroom apartment close to $2,000 a month. I don't know about you, it's yeah. like, but $2,000 a month is a lot of money for me. Yeah, and, and I say that's the, that makes uh, Long Beach the fifth most expensive city in California to live in. The fifth yeah. most right. expensive city. And I know, so, and that's, so you got 2000 a month, but then if you're a single parent, mom or dad, with a, a couple of kids, that 2000 even is more ominous because now you're talking about all the ancillary expenses that go with that. Right. It's really tough. And, and we here help uh, families, but uh, oftentimes there can be people with an, an income of fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and they think, "Wow, that's great!" But when you add those numbers in there, it's not so great after all. No, it's not so great. And according to to the federal housing standards, the the definition of affordable affordability is that thirty percent of your income should be going toward your housing costs. So if you're, if you're paying, yeah, thirty percent. So if you're paying two thousand dollars a month for an apartment, yeah. and that's supposed to be thirty percent of your income. Yeah. So what are you supposed to be making? Somewhere yeah. around six thousand a month. Right. That's that's exorbitantly high. Yeah. So with with that sort of the backdrop and coming from the organization that you were working with, and it sounds like you had the support and um, uh, energy of the people in the community, you decided that Libre would be. Uh, one step towards a, a solution. Can you explain what it is and how it came about? Well, sure. Again, as I think that uh, I mentioned, the, the residents were really calling for this. Mm -hmm. And and it, at the time, I was in, in transition of, of jobs, and mm -hmm. I had a decision to make, either find another job or right. stick around and help the residents form Libre. And so I took it upon myself to just live off, off, live off of unemployment so that I can spend the majority of my time to, to help organize the residents and, and help mm -hmm. form and strategically plan uh, mm -hmm. Libre organization. And so the, for the last year, we've been in strategic planning and in September, mm -hmm. we launched the, the organization and made it public. And that was on September 22nd, which was not only our launch party, if you will, right. but it was right. also in alignment with National Renters Day of Action. Uh, mm -hmm. We're part of a national campaign called Homes for All and uh, over 50 cities across the United States were 
taking action uh, to support renters' rights, tenant mm -hmm. protections, and affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, a housing crisis bus tour of Long Beach on September 22nd, where right. we took people from North Long Beach to Central to downtown, when we talked about all of the housing issues that, that we're experiencing here. And we had residents share their stories. Uh, we invited uh, elected officials, we invited press, media, and uh, community organizational allies. Well, and we were showing some images of that tour. Would you say in the uh, few uh, seconds that we have left that for this particular segment that it was a great success for you? And what was some of the feedback that you got? Oh, well, we got a lot of great articles in the press, uh, and I think the people that were on the tour had a lot of great things to say. I believe that it was a success, but me sort of managing the, the, the event of the day, <laughs> it was difficult to have that objective perspective, so I relied on a lot of the feedback that, uh, that was received, and I think that, that it went well. Rem members were happy, the residents were happy, and, and I think it was, a good, it was a good start to the organization. Right, and it sounds like it was well attended, so that was a good thing for people to actually see not through the stories that you tell, but through their own eyes, what the scenario looked like. So, right. so kudos to you for being innovative in that way. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we will continue our discussion with Jorge, Jorge Rivera. Stay tuned for more of Long Beach Times. Debra, are you tired of coming home to an empty, lonely house? Why not try Animal Match Rescue Team? We are a small dog rescue group in Long Beach. AMRT is looking for loving homes and has a variety of small dogs to choose from. Just come to Petco 6500 PCH any weekend from 11 to 2 to see just a few of our little dogs. To find out how you could adopt, foster, volunteer, or donate, go to amrt.net. 100% of all proceeds go to our animals. Right, Pearl? You'll be glad you did.
Welcome back. I'm your host, Derek J. Simpson. I'm here with Jorge Rivera of Long Beach Residents Empowered, or LIPRE. And we were talking a lot in the first part of our conversation, Jorge, about what some of the problems are. But I'd like to focus more on what some of the solutions are on a positive note that uh, you've begun this organization and you've got a strategic plan. So what do you see as next steps for you guys and what you're doing now? Okay, well, first I want to contextualize that question by saying sure. that, that the housing issues and the housing crisis that we're experiencing in Long Beach is a very complex thing. Right. And it's a multifaceted approach, lots of things happening all at once, and so there's, there's not one silver bullet. Gotcha. Uh, as, as, as the type of organization that we are, we're a total bottoms-up type of approach, and so we, we do a lot of community listening. And we've been doing that over the last year and we continuously do that and we develop our campaigns and our strategy around what it is that the community wants mm -hmm. and what, what their needs are. And so we're, we're sort of wrapping up that, that process for ourselves and, and we're developing campaigns around it. And I think that right now that the community is asking for uh, better habitability issue, uh, c conditions and also more tenant protections. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are talking about the rents are just way too high and they're increasing way too fast and they're finding themselves being displaced, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is a very stressful thing. And so we want to be able to support the emotional and the psychological health of our communities as they're going through, through this. But uh, I think that for us as an organization, we, we are here to support what it is that the residents want to do and how they want to do it. And, but we want to be strategic and we want to be sophisticated about it as well because we have to work with other allied organizations or even our city council leaders to be able to enact some of these policies to remedy and alleviate the, the stress and the crisis. Do you find that, uh, speaking of our political leadership, do you find that they are sensitized to the issues that you represent and are at least coming around to finding ways to work with organizations such as yours and even ours here at Long Beach Community Action Partnership? Well, I think I think a, a lot of what community organizing is is about building relationships. Mm -hmm. And as a new organization and with new membership, we are we are just starting that process with our city council members. And so we have slated in the coming months a few meetings and legislative visits with city council so that we can start building those relationships and also try to uh, assess where it is that they stand on these issues because they have to also answer to a lot of right. constituents, you right. know, not just our group. And so I know that they're in a very precarious and a tough situation because they're getting it from both sides of the fence, if you will. Right. And, and so we, we have to try to work together and try to find compromises where, where we're able to. Uh, but uh, we haven't yet assessed where our city council members stand on some of the issues that our, our residents are calling for. Now you mentioned there's no silver bullet and I get that from a, a fighting poverty perspective such as what we do as a mission. There's no silver bullet there and yet the homeless population is growing statewide. Um, so I, I get that. What would you say then would be, let's use an organization like Long Beach Community Action Partnership. How could we be more supportive of your mission at Libre in helping you move that agenda forward? Well, with an organization such as yourself with thousands of people actually coming through your doors and you're addressing uh, levels of poverty and you're addressing most likely renters that might right. be a little bit cost burden, right? We are. And so identifying those those people that, that actually have housing situations that they would like to learn more about, to find out what the renter rights are, mm -hmm. and what they can do to, to help, uh, help themselves out in those situations. Mm -hmm. So connecting, connecting yourself with organizations such as ours and being able to leverage the, the, the members that you have and the participants that come through your programs and right. connecting them with organizations such as ours. I think it is is a great help because we are we are a nonprofit right now. We're all volunteer based, and so mm -hmm. we don't have any funding. And we're hoping that that's going to change in the few in <laughs> right. the few months that are coming. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the for the time being, all the leveraging that we can we can do with our organizational partners and allies, mm -hmm. and and getting people involved and informed is mm -hmm. is probably the best way that that you can help. Now, on the other side of this equation are the property owners, um, and as they are watching this particular interview, what would be the message that you would want them to take away when they look at Libre, what, what is that message that you would like for them to hear? 
Well, I mean, we're obviously advocating for, for the renters, and, yeah. and I know that the property owners have, have their, their own personal stake in this right. as well. And I think that there's always room for, for dialogue and conversation to find, to find a way to, to be able to take their perspective and their point of view into account, but, but really, really focusing in on, on the benefit of the community, the overall community. I think that people need to realize that our housing crisis it affects everybody because even people in the third district or in the fifth district, they're having community meetings around homelessness. Right. Because why do you think people are homeless? They're, they're homeless because they don't have an affordable place to live. Right. And, and people that provide the, the mental health and, and the substance abuse sort of services to, to wrap around them need, that, need to put them in a home so that they can wrap those services around them and be able to help them out. So our homeless population is affecting other parts of the city and it's going to continue to affect other parts of the city. If we want to build a truly healthy and safe community, we have to be able to service all of our residents and that includes even the homeless population. And the most, the most, uh, the most basic remedy to that is just providing them an affordable place to live. And then also look at preventive measures be, so that we're, we're ensuring that people aren't becoming homeless. Uh, as you know, we went to City Hall when they were having the homeless discussion, and we took six different residents there that were being evicted from two separate buildings. And so this is over 44 units, uh, affordable units, that are now being lost. And these people have been homeless before, and now they're at risk of being homeless again. So as we talk about how are we going to alleviate and remedy the homeless population, what are we doing to prevent it? Now, you talked about being volunteer-based. Uh, are, if someone's watching and they want to get involved with Libre or want to learn more just about this whole affordable housing issue, what would you suggest they do in terms of follow-up to contact you or anyone else that's involved in this movement? Well, right now, because we're, we're a non-funded organization, we just have our social media pages, which is Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and they can look us up as Long Beach Residents Empowered. Uh, in the coming months, we're gonna ha start having monthly community meetings. They can attend one of those. They can reach out to us and email us. Mm -hmm. We're also gonna start having renters' rights workshops. And as part of our, our health and wellness approach, we're going to be starting a renter support group where we can support people on an emotional and a psychological mm -hmm. uh, level uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, to help them through any, any stressful events that they might be having. So just participating in, in any of, of those spaces mm -hmm. and just reaching out to us and offering some of their time to help us make phone calls, help us do outreach, help us educate other people and get more, more involved. With, with Long Beach being nearly 60% of renters, right. if we're able to organize the vast majority of those, mm -hmm. then we would probably be able to, to progress policies in a much quicker fashion. So the more people involved, the quicker things are going to get yeah. done. Is there a city that's kind of like got it? I'm a, I'm a proponent of studying, as I say, to produce excellence, you study excellence. So is there someone who's got it right that you say, wow, if we could be like them, we'd be <laughs> a lot further along? Or is this pretty much what many major cities are dealing with and no one's really got it yet? Well, yeah, the housing crisis is a national issue, which is why you know over 50 cities across the US yeah. were having these Renters Day of Action. Yeah. I don't know of one city that has it right. right. There are a lot of cities that are doing a lot of progressive things and we're, we're learning from those cities mm -hmm. and we're working with those those community organizations in those locations to mm -hmm. find out what it is that they're doing, how is it working, and how is it helping, and how and is that something that might be able to work here in Long Beach? Mm -hmm. So we're part of a, a statewide coalition as well as a national coalition, so that we can learn from what other cities are doing successfully mm -hmm. and see if we can bring some of those ideas and implement them here in Long Beach because Long Beach, as as of now, has no renter protections, and no progressive policies to ensure funding, creation, or mm -hmm. preservation of affordable housing. Is there any one particular uh, initiative, since there's no city overall that's got it right, but are, are there a couple of best practices that you would like to adopt right away that you, if you could, you know, really put your touch on it? Well, I think, I think what we found, like we see like in Los Angeles, as soon as they declared a homeless state of emergency, lots yeah. of stuff started happening, right? Okay. And so I think maybe just the acknowledgement that we're having a housing crisis here in Long Beach right. might actually get the ball rolling. 
And so mm -hmm. just maybe maybe having uh, the mayor and our city leaders to be able to, to declare a housing crisis and then to, to start taking steps and measures to be able to try to alleviate that I think would help a lot. And I know mm -hmm. some of the city council members have been mentioning inclusionary zoning or housing. Since we have a lot of development that is slated to happen in the coming years, let's mm -hmm. set some of those units that are being developed aside mm -hmm. for very low or extremely low income residents so that we start housing them and building more affordable housing. And then let's try to put some renter protections in place so that we ensure that we're not losing any more affordable units and we're keeping people in their homes. As people move around, you know, it makes, it makes the community unstable. So when people, if people are concerned with crime, if people are concerned with safety, they should be concerned with providing safe and stable housing for our folks because that is a huge contributor to sort of the instability and the strength of a community. So it's like housing is central to everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you're concerned with all these ancillary issues and interconnected issues, mm -hmm. you should be concerned with housing too. Closing thought that you would like to leave everyone viewing with about Libre and what you're doing? Well, I think, uh, I think what we're doing with, uh, with Libre and housing uh, focus is, is an issue that everybody should be involved with, even though you're not directly impacted or affected by it, because it's, it's a community health and safety issue. And if we don't start talking about it that way, then, then we're, we're really not going to get involved to the degree that we need to to be able to resolve it. Everybody should be concerned with what's happening with housing and our residents here. Everybody should, and, and kudos to you again because your passion is unsurpassed and, and you're really involved and, and people believe in you and uh, keep up the good work. I'm really proud of what you do in our community. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that concludes our show. I'd like to thank Jorge Rivera for joining us today. Be sure to follow PadNet TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates. We also welcome your comments and thoughts regarding this show as we strive to make Long Beach Lands a favorite source of local news, information, and entertainment. This show has been brought to you with support from the Long Beach Community Action Partnership. Thank you for watching Long Beach Lands. Mm -hmm.